Thank you so much, Nina. Uh, speaking just for myself, that was absolutely fascinating. Even as someone who, and you're lucky for this, who does not design type or do any other kind of graphic design, um, just sort of hearing that process is fantastic. So thank you again. You're very um, welcome. I'm just pulling up the thing again. Oh, yeah. Oh, good plan. Right? There. Yes. So we are now about to crown the 2017 uh, Uptake Prize winners. Um, so first of all, we're going to start with our runner-up. And is Joseph, uh, Joseph Allegro is here, if you don't mind coming on up. Yeah. Meadows. And so first prize for this year's Updike uh, prize for student type design and the annual trophy uh, which accompanies it, which is a functioning and um, previously used composing stick. Um, <laughs> this year's winner is Erica Karras. Thank you to both. Once again, absolutely a pleasure to work with both of you. I look forward to looking uh, to working with next year's Updike Prize winner as well. Uh, and so this now means two things are the case. One is the 2018 Updike Prize for Student Type Design is now underway. So if you're here listening uh, and in the middle of a project or just about to start a project, please do uh, get a hold of me, talk to our speaker tonight, talk to previous uh, finalists, and ask them about the experience. Um, there are business cards and brochures and things about the library in, on the table outside, so definitely pick one of those up or come and talk to me. Uh, second thing that it means is that we now get to ask Nina lots of questions. Um, and so I told them that this group of people would be plenty loud to go ahead and just sort of shout their questions at Nina um, without help of a microphone. So um, thank you, Nina. I'll get out of the way and let you answer questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, questions. Nina. Yes, um, Richard. I was wondering with all the joy you take in looking at vernacular lettering and photograph and signage, have you ever been inspired by anything Yeah, I have. Did every, uh, do I need to repeat the questions, or can you guys hear them back there? Okay. Uh, so the question was whether all of the looking at vernacular lettering has led to any actual typeface projects. The answer is it, it has, and it has. I mean, it depends what you count as a typeface project. I have a bunch of like sketches sitting around and like unfinished things that are, in fact, based more or less directly on, on lettering that I've seen. Um, more often what kind of happens, and I don't, I don't know if this is like a normal sort of process, but I feel like I look at a lot of stuff and at some point some conglomerate idea hits me where I'm like, this is, a, this is a shape I need to draw or this is a set of shapes I need to draw and then I try to tease out afterwards where those came from. And it's often like a combination of, of things I've seen in different places. But the, the vernacular lettering certainly makes its way in there. How small a detail do I need to take off on? You mean in the, in the research? In the, in the vernacular and things that you see. I think that's variable for me. Like sometimes the, the thing that, that inspires me will be like a small detail in the execution, but sometimes it will also just be like the mood of a piece or the, the overall proportions, the kind of footing it stands on, the overall gesture. Um, that feels like a fuzzy answer, but I feel like I can't, I can't pin that down, like, as a general rule. Jason?
do you feel like that kind of gave you a different way of approaching design than maybe students that were really sort of going into type design first? Definitely, yes. So the question was whether, um, yeah, having been a practitioner of graphic design first before I got into type design proper, it, whether that gave me a different um, approach to type design. I think that's definitely true. Um, certainly uh, with, with Ernestine, kind of my first big typeface pro design project, it was very consciously kind of the effort to make a typeface that I myself had been missing in my work. Um, and it is of course true that if, you, if you're a user of type, you have um, the advantage that you, you know out of your own practice kind of what, what kinds of things are useful, what kinds of things like get in the way more like. Um, so I think coming from that perspective has, has definitely helped me. Um, and I was, I was a bit annoyed that when I was at art school, I didn't really have, get a chance to, to go fully into type design. We had some, you know, some type intro classes that definitely helped. Um, but, um, like, by which I'm trying to say, I don't think it's wrong to start with type design early. Um, but I think having having a, a background or at least a concurrent experience with with using type in in you know compositions and graphic design and web design whatever um, definitely helps to 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 add that perspective that type is not a thing that you make and then it exists in a vacuum it is a tool and it is a, a material for other people to 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 make work with which I also enjoy I'm like I feel like I'm always two steps away from you know, the actual end product that, that gets seen. Sure. More questions? Bring them. <laughs> yes? A particular philosophy that shapes everything? A particular philosophy? Like design philosophy? Any kind of philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hard. Um... I think the closest, the closest thing to that that I have is sort of an unwitting minimalism almost despite myself. I think that just comes with growing up in Switzerland. And no, seriously, I mean, you're laughing. I'm, I'm actually serious. It's like growing up around like a lot of modernist design uh, has sort of instilled this in me as the way I work is very much Especially, especially in graphic design, though, not so much in type design, but in, in, in graphic design, the way I work is very much sort of reduced, like reducing something to the maximum of things it needs, but the minimum that it has to have. Wait. <laughs> the other way around. You know what I mean. Um, make, making, making the point with as little stuff as needed. And it's actually the hardest thing for me that probably the hardest challenge I faced was when a client came back and said it's nice but it needs a bit more something. And I was like, what, what? Like, what would you like me to add? It's like everything you need is there. And <laughs> so I'm really bad at adding things. I'm really bad at like ornamenting and, and inventing things that I don't think need to be there. Um, And I think type design, type design is like really a different discipline in my head that, that works differently because it's more sculptural or painterly and in some, because you're making these shapes, you're not really arranging things. Um, so I think, I don't know, that, that feels a bit more organic and less mechanical, but I, I couldn't reduce that to a philosophy really. Other than, I mean, if, if we're talking about the purpose of design rather than sort of the, the formal language, I'm, I'm a big adherent of the idea that, that typefaces in particular are, especially if we're talking about text typefaces for like reading, which is most of what I do, that those really are there to serve, to serve a purpose, to serve A, the person who uses them for whatever purpose, and, and B, the person who reads them. And you don't want to really get into either people's way, but you want to help them tell their story um, and, and add that particular flavor to their story. So I really, I, I feel like I try to get out of the way more than I try to, you know, make, make my work the center of whatever. <laughs> yes? What are your thoughts on the future of uh, typeface design for print, maybe especially books? 
uh, visually, technologically. Um, only easy questions. I think books are going to stay around, certainly in some in some form or another. I think the definition of what a book is 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 well is already changing, um, and I'm cu I'm actually really curious to kind of keep observing how typeface design is going to react to these different kind of typographic realities. Like, uh, for example, I'm not an ebook reader because I I like. I like physical books, but um, I keep hearing that the Kindle used to have this this terrible justified typography with the huge holes in the lines and so forth. And uh, I wonder, like, if we can. I would like to see a future where these different formats of of books or you know long form reading materials um, can all reach a level of of typographic sophistication that makes it actually nice to read them. Um, the other thing that I find um, really a missed opportunity is that I find, like, as a person who has designed books for print before, um, that the typography of a book can really add so much to the experience and to the specific, to, to like, under, underscore the specific tone and the content and, and the voice in which, for example, a novel speaks, uh, that I personally find this really sad to miss, to lose that as, as you know, uh, as a design option in electronic format. So I wonder if there could be a way um, to bring that back in, or maybe I'm just nostalgic. Um, but yeah, I also don't think paper books are, are going away that fast. I mean, print has been declared dead so many times over so much time, it's still here. I mean, it's sure, it's shifting, it's reducing, it's, it's, it's becoming a different thing. Um, but I don't. I don't think it's gonna go away anytime soon. Yes, in the back. A typical day in the studio. Um, that's always a difficult question because there really isn't so much a typical day. I mean, it, it depends what kind of project I'm working on. It also depends what kind or what kind of projects, plural, are going on at any given time. It also depends on what phase those are in. Uh, there are times when most, I, most of what I do is, is drawing and proofing and revising, um, but I also do a lot of, um, like the, the stuff that is around that, like for example, research, or I also build uh, little tools that we use to, to for example, test um, aspects of, of fonts or uh, run specific kinds of proofs that we that we use to check, you know, for whatever. So, on a, on any given day, I might actually be doing some programming, and I might be doing some drawing, or I, or I might be sitting in the library corner doing some research, um, or do some research online. So it's it's really very varied, which which is one of the things that I that I really enjoy about this this line of work is that it's at the same time very, very deep and very focused, but it also kind of reaches out into all of these other areas that are connected to it. Oh, that was a hand, yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have two questions. The first, uh, would you ever consider naming a, a font after yourself? And second, uh, <laughs> a history question. Uh, you know, like the classical typefaces, such as Bologna, Marimon, and so Whose idea was it? Um, so to start with the, the first question, I would not consider naming a font after myself just because it's already a bit of a nightmare for myself to live with a last name that nobody can spell or pronounce. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to do that to a font. Um, seriously, also it's not like, like I said before, I like, I like being a bit in the background and I don't, I don't need to put my name on, on things, that's, that's okay. I, I also always wonder how you move on from there. Like once you've named a font after yourself, you're basically de declaring that to be your magnum opus. What do you do after that? <laughs> Name it after yourself, number two, I don't know. Um, as with the, the classics, Bodoni, Garamond, and so forth, I believe, and there are people in the audience who are more qualified than I to answer this question, but what I believe happened is that at the point where these typefaces were originally designed, 
typefaces did not really have names so much as more generic sorts of descriptions uh, under which they appeared in the relevant specimen books. And then it was later when those designs were distilled into more modern formats um, for modern typesetting, um, you know, be, it, be it in um, metal or in a photo type or in, uh, later in digital, that uh, you know, some newer designer came in, drew a revival of, of that to, to them summed up what the style of this earlier um, punch cutter or designer had been uh, and then name it after them. But that's, uh, I don't believe that Badoni ever knew that there was gonna be a font named Badoni or a group of fonts all named Badoni that are all different depending on who made them. Um, is that right? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I love the story of you kind of uh, answering back to your professors at Tanzania by double downing, on, you double down on your uh, the criticism of your coming to me and thought, well, okay, I'm going to make my entire final project based on this incorrect. <laughs> Um, well, I think the way the way that I presented that was a little bit pointed in that the first project where this this question came up and the, the, this one professor told me to not do this was a very um, precisely targeted brief where the typeface was supposed to be based on broadnip, like classic Dutch broadnip calligraphy. So that would have been outside the scope of this project. He also had some specific points where he said, what are you going to do with the serifs and the caps? And I was like, I don't know. Um, so that was one thing I changed in, the, in, in my final project was that I said, I'm not going to base it on Brodnip model, but on the, on the point of pen structure, which is a bit more forgiving or a bit more flexible. And um, I, also, I actually, I don't know if this is true, but I heard that they had such an influx of people wanting to do reverse contrast project that at some point they actually said, uh, they, they actually started actively discouraging students from that. <laughs> Just because everybody was like, it, it's also true that reverse contrast is a bit of a thing that type designers keep trying um, and keep experimenting with, which I think is great because I think we need more, more more work that explores that that part of the design space, but it tends to, yeah, it tends to be a bit polarizing. <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to apologize to everybody who tried to make a reverse contrast type <laughs> after me. <laughs> oh yes, there is a hand. That's a, that's a really good question. It's a, a, cha a challenging question, too. I think there is invariably a certain degree of abstraction or of, for lack of a better word, cleaning up or systematizing that has to happen between uh, you know, taking vernacular lettering as inspiration and making it into a digital font. I'm sure if I, if I was active in, in sign painting or, or in lettering, you know, with, with actual physical materials, which I'm not, um, then I would be curious if that translation process could be more direct. As such, I feel like I am inspired by um, multiple aspects of the vernacular lettering, only some of which I can actually apply to my own work. Because, you know, things like surface structures or or these, these elements of decay, I think, um, are things that I find very fascinating visually, but that I honestly wouldn't know how to translate into digital designs 
other than trying to, I mean, it's a bit more of an involved translation process, you know, trying to find out how can digital things be drawn that they don't seem overly clean or overly, like, um, cookie-cutter, you know, like, mechanical. Um, but it's definitely, like, I, I think there's a lot of... Um, and that that's definitely something that I've been that I've been thinking about more lately, uh, about the you know and it, as a, again as a Swiss person who is now fascinated by these more grittier styles that's that's certainly a learning process that I'm also in to kind of let go of that the the, the, the shininess of the perfection and that sometimes it's it's exactly the 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 not exactly straight lines or the not exactly you know smooth curves that that actually have a, a kind of warmth that can be very attractive, but it's hard to handle. That's something that I feel like I'm, I'm still very much in the middle of. Right. And that was a, an opportunity that he allowed himself to get into. It. I think that's the mm -hmm. that's the phenomenon that I was you know, asking about. Mm -hmm. Do we allow that to happen in our work and have fun with it and see it mm -hmm. in a new way? That's fascinating. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's definitely something that that interests me. I was just wa thinking about wondering how. Um, what what are forms that that could come into a drawing process rather than a composing process? Um, I had a student at Yale last year who um, came in with a sample of type that she had found from, I believe, Brazil. And it was a typeface that we... It took us a while to find out what it was. Um, it was a European... I forgot it again. Was it Dutch or English? That made its way across the Atlantic, but was missing the accents needed for, for Portuguese. And it was like the, the sample she had was like a title page from a, from a book from like the, I believe around, right around 1800. Um, and there was a tilde above an O, which was actually a rotated J. And we, so we talked about that a lot, you know, it's like because, because she was totally fascinated by that. It was like repurposing things. Um, because you, which which is kind of the same thing that that you were telling a story about uh, about Weingart, um, and uh, but it's hard to kind of integrate that into a drawing process because the moment you draw a tilde like that, it's a tilde that you drew that you drew to look like a J, and it's not a J anymore. You know? So it's like you have to kind of go around a couple more corners to to integrate that that kind of. Um, the resistance that the material offers, because of course that's a problem with digital, that you don't have that resistance, so you need to create it. Or, or, or it comes up in different forms maybe, but you have to look for it somewhere else, I believe. This is an interesting discussion. I, I feel like I, I'd have to think more. Yes? Ah, but I think cool. that's probably more of the way it happens, more unconsciously, that like the swoop that beautiful five. And then I saw <laughs> something like that coming back in one of the sketches. Right. I hope, I hope, that's cool. I mean, that does map to my own, to, to my own experience of drawing a thing and then wondering where it came from and then finding bits and pieces among mm -hmm. things that I've seen. And it also kind of proves that the looking at stuff actually works because that is the intended result that to come back. 
Once more, cool. thanks to Nina. Thank you, guys. And I look forward to seeing everybody next year at roughly this time. <laughs> thanks.